Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today we want to do a very quick update on the subject of Hex OS. We are on the back of recording another video that is either live or not. I'm not sure. Check it out if it is. But you can tell because of this lumberjack shirt nonsense I've got going on. But we want to talk about Hex OS. More precisely, we want to talk about the Q&A that we did with John from Hex OS and Eshtech last week at the time of recording at the very least. Now, I was in that Q&A. We went through a lot of the user questions about that software. And I think it would be an understatement to say um, that, you know, one point perhaps um, was standing out more than others for a lot of users. Eddie has now watched that Q&A, and before we get on to it, um, Ed, would you like to tell me your reaction, what you thought of how the software, the Q&A, everything about it? Yeah, actually quite impressed uh, with a software that is coming up and the way they're going to be pricing it. It seems like it's not going to be subscription-based per se. You can have one of our license and use it. And does uh, for me, Tunas was very complicated OS uh, to have, actually, for your NAS, especially if you're a home user, it can be, you know, mind-boggling to set things up, especially with ZFS and the way you need to install mm. apps and things like that. So it's a very easy and simplified solution there. And there's also mm. just a few clicks to get through the uh, setup process. So I do love it. And I actually love as well the way that um, something like a cloud link is created, like something like Cloud ID from QNAP or um, mm. Quick Connect from Snorgy. So have that similar service. So it goes through their relay service so you can connect to your NAS. It's uh, very good to have and uh, also a secure way to connect. So you don't need to figure out your own VPN or port forwarding and uh, keeping your uh, connection safe. So I do like this stuff. But what I heard that it is not possible is that they have worked only on this cloud way of connecting to this NAS, to this OS. And what happens if there is no internet or if you don't want uh, to be internet in the first place? There is no mm. way to connect it. You need to go through the back door through the um, uh, TrueNAS service True uh, admin NAS. panel and, and then configure and access things that way, which could be really annoying. I think for a lot of users, I mean, you've just got to take one look at the comments. I'll probably scroll them here on screen. That was pretty much one of the biggest negative takeaways for a lot of users about this software. The idea that the point of this platform is to make a TrueNAS powerful server more user friendly and i think for users that are moving away from cloud that want to have that local access storage only the idea that they're suddenly met with this complexity on the lan is a real bummer now after that q a and this is kind of the main reason for this video um uh, john reached out to me and said how they took a lot of that feedback on board we could talk about corporate thanks for giving us your suggestions guys and all that wank speak but realistically i think they did see that reaction and suddenly realized you know what we may have to shift the goalposts maybe shift our priorities for this platform um so i'm going to read the statement they sent through and this was with regard to uh, queries that they received with regards to online access, and mainly that users didn't like the idea that to access this dashboard, it could only be done via web management, not on a local. So they stated this, we have now officially added the local UI to our roadmap as a confirmed item. We have we had planned for this since day one, but we're hoping they wouldn't be necessary as adding a local UI doesn't add any new features to the solution, but we fully understand the feedback and are committed to bringing a local UI to Hex OS. So there's another part to that statement I'll get onto in a bit. But on the one hand, yeah, it's good news that they are adding it on there. And I think he alluded to as such on the video anyway. So when we first started on this mission, our thought originally was we really liked Plex's model. We thought, okay, we they have a local UI and they have a hosted UI. And if you're on the LAN and you want to connect locally, you can do that. And if you want to connect remotely, you can do that. Uh, that seems like a good solution because it gets around a lot of the challenges with things like setting up secure remote access, which is always a bane mm. for any new home server user. Um, so that was the original thought process. And then when we got started uh, early on, we said, well, you know, maybe the first thing we do is we just build a hosted UI 
and we'll worry about the local stuff later because building two mm -hmm. UIs is two projects. It's two sets of code and two different conditions too, right? Like we can, we can rely on knowing that the server's online if it's a hosted UI, right? Because it's connected. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's not, we can't rely on that. So all of these um, uh, hosted or connected features that we want to build in wouldn't work on a local UI if the, if the standard is it has to be able to work offline, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we thought, let's build the hosted one first because it's, it's going to be more feature rich. It's going to be the more difficult one to build. Uh, and then we'll port something locally later on. I'm not saying that a offline UI doesn't provide any value. What we are saying is that it provides significantly less value than the hosted UI. And if we're going to build something local, it certainly isn't part of our mission for 1.0. It would be something after that. And to be fair, even after that, it would, it would likely come in the form of, say, a Docker container that we would load after the configuration is complete mm -hmm. that would provide a stripped down version of a local UI to give you basic controls like can I start and stop apps, can I restart the server, mm -hmm. can I replace a failed disk. But making grandiose configuration changes to your server when the internet's down, I just don't think that's super important for a home user. Uh, I'm still not hearing that it's going to be a day one thing. So whether it's there in the beta, whenever it comes out, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but hopefully that will help them get through the, you know, this face onslaught of negativity about the web managed uh, UI there. But hearing that, does that make you feel better or worse about things? Yeah, definitely. So it looks like they are actually respecting what people say. And they will, if they put that on the roadmap, they will most likely implement this new feature because that's what mm. other uh, brands are doing. And you're supposed to follow this, you know, trail of, of things, how, how others did you, you learn from other brands and you create something better than that. Um, obviously, mm. when you're starting just out, you want to, uh, you don't have much resources to invest in, so you can focus just on one thing. And they were thinking like, okay, this is for home market, so therefore they need to invest in this very easy way of connecting to this NAS, and the easiest way is obviously connecting through the cloud. But uh, obviously it's not the case. There's mid-tier that they need IP-based uh, access to it, not just uh, you know proxy-based. When they deploy this, it's going to be some kind of containerized version, of course. And then there is the question of, running a container within TrueNAS, you're going to have to give it borderline unlimited power to be able to manage the system. So I think a lot of that is going to be the combative element of this update. Again, I hope it's there on day one. I think a lot of users are hoping for it on day one for that early jumping on board. But I think, you know, they need to be a little bit louder about that roadmap featuring this very early doors. Now, the other concern that was raised, a few other comments after that Q&A, was to do with security related to web management. A lot of users, whether it is they don't like the idea of a third, this web management portal basically being the keys to get in, or that data transmission may need to be required with remote access to data because notwithstanding authentication, getting into your system and conducting troubleshooting, you know, management of the system, what about the transfer of data? How and where is that data traveling through? And a lot of users were inquiring about the nature of that in this web management side of things and what are the security protocols in place? Now, um, the con uh, response I got, this is the second half, uh, from John's message here, and it says, some users have complained about security concerns related to our admin access of their system. I can confirm that in 2025, there will be a mechanism for TrueNAS API keys, which will allow us to have limited privileges addressing concerns of if Eshtek gets hacked, our servers are at risk of destructive action. So they're addressing it there, and I'm feeling a little better. I, I would like to see a little bit more on that in terms of 2025 is next year, the beta is going to roll out, and I know a beta is not going to be a complete item. Um, but how, does that make you feel better about remote access security? Um, it's always the case. And uh, it's not just security, it's also the speed, because uh, Snow G, for example, and QNAP as well, they have their relay service as well. And it's usually limited to one or two megabytes a second. So that can slow things down quite massively. And obviously, you mm. don't know how encrypted this data is when it goes through their proxy servers, because that's one point of failure. If someone hacks into their proxy server, they could potentially gain access to all traffic going through it. So obviously mm. it's not uh, very, um, you know, con it's very concerning sort of thing. But um, 
simplicity requires, um, you know, sacrifices. Yeah, kind of trust me vibe, I guess. I mean, ultimately, the more they integrate with TrueNAS and TrueNAS' own security protocol, the better, because TrueNAS, again, much like Synology, is one of the brands in server storage that has been hit by ransomware and malware the least, I would argue. You know, and TrueNAS has that fantastic jailing system, and a lot of its authentication and controls are hardwired. Um, but again, it's that relay via the Eshtek, uh, the Eshtek servers, as it were, because it's that vibe of people don't feel like they're accessing it via a TrueNAS port, or they're accessing it via an Eshtek slash HexOS uh, portal there, which again doesn't have that history and reputation yet. So I think the more they lean into TrueNAS security, the more they lean into TrueNAS API checks and authentication, the better. But ultimately, this has just been a very quick update to that Q&A with these additional information and bits of uh, details that we've been sent over by John there. Again, I'm quietly hopeful. I've said it since the beginning, NAS software and, you know, private server ownership in general has been trying for 20, 30, close to 40 years to get the holy grail. Fast, secure, feature-rich, stable, cheap. People want those things. And I think this is as close as we're seeing as a partnership item with TrueNAS. But they have seemed to have fluffed the landing a little bit in terms of this uh, remote access web GUI. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching, guys. Thanks so much for your input today, Eddie. Uh, we'll talk about this more soon when a beta rolls out, I'm sure. Uh, but apart from that, have yourselves a fantastic week, and we'll see you next time.